What is up, guys, and welcome to the Photo Finish, Scott Radio's home for motorsports in general and NASCAR in particular. I'm your host, Ben Schneider, and joining me in the booth tonight is my fellow Com Arts major and diehard, diehard Deegan family <laughs> fan, Matt Cole. Matt, good to see you. Good to see you. Thank you for having me on, man. I appreciate it. So just briefly introduce yourself and... I guess first off, explain how you got to be such a big fan of Brian and Haley and the Deegan family. Yeah, sure. Well, uh, I know that we met in Com Arts. Um, it was visual storytelling with Scott right. Thurman. That's where that's where it all began, um, and now it's blossomed into this beautiful friendship. <laughs> but as far as like when I came across the Deegans, it was it was really a God thing, to be honest. Um, you know, in the interest of time, I won't you know get too much into it, but, um, you know, my testimony is that God revealed himself to me three times. The second time, he revealed himself to me through someone named Lacey Sturm. She's involved with the Whosoever's Movement, which is a movement based out of Southern California. And, uh, you know, I was looking through who he has as uh, featured speakers, and one of them was this Brian Deegan dude. And I saw his race car, and I was like, that's kind of cool, like that he, you know, this guy's out here, you know, telling his story and spreading the word. And, uh, then I ended up finding out he had a daughter that was that was racing and two sons that are racing, um, and it really just kind of blossomed from there. Um, I, you know, I really respect them for, you know, what they do in the sport, but they're also out there spreading the gospel, which blows me away. Yeah, that's great. We're going to talk about Haley Deegan a lot coming up later on in the show. A uh, little bit of history made out of Meridian Speedway in Idaho. Haley Deegan becoming the first woman ever to win a NASCAR race at the K-9 level. But before we do that, we have to start, I think, uh, with the Charlotte Roval making its debut. Now, this was one of the most highly anticipated uh, NASCAR races that I can think of in a long time. Um, before the Roval layout, the last new track to enter the Cup Series schedule was in 2011 when Kentucky got a Cup date. Um, I'm hesitant to call this a new track because it still is Charlotte, but NASCAR fans have been longing for new tracks for a long time and road courses for a long time. Um, the main problem is NASCAR has these contracts in with the tracks, uh, so there's not much they can do in terms of that until a few years down the road. But what they were able to do was convince Charlotte to change one of their oval races to a roval race, which road course oval is how they got the name. It combines wow. the infield road course with the oval layout. Uh, with a couple of chicanes added to slow the cars down for a road course setup and everything. Um, so a lot of people were interested to see how this would go because this is a very narrow track, especially in the infield. Um, a lot of people were thinking it was just going to be a total crapshoot and uh, some of the cynics were already proclaiming it a disaster before it even happened and a bad idea. Uh, and a lot of incidents actually did happen in testing and in practice, um, and a lot of them were on the backstretch chicane uh, right before oval turns three and four. And the big problem was the wall at the end of the chicane stuck out a little too far. So as drivers were coming through the chicane trying to minimize the amount of speed they had to take off, a lot of them weren't making the corner. And the penalty the, the penalty for cutting the corner was thus uh, basically a torn up race car with a mm. destroyed front end. And after about five incidents, NASCAR finally said, okay, forget it. We're changing the angle of the wall um, and moving it back a few feet so that cars just kind of hop over the curb and the so-called turtles is what the blue things were described okay. as. Um, and I personally, I'm going to play devil's advocate here. A lot of fans applauded this move because it did prevent probably a lot of cars from being torn up. And we actually did see uh, relatively clean races for the most part. I personally would have rather seen them try to have the drivers adapt to the track rather than adapting the track to the drivers. But I do understand where they were coming from in terms of safety. Um, so, yeah, that was the main modification made to the track. So the Xfinity race actually ended up being rather tame, uh, which yeah. was a little surprising considering those are the drivers that are still in development, don't have as much experience. Um, there were a couple of spins here and there. But Chase Briscoe, who drove for the now defunct Brad Keselowski racing in the truck series last year and is driving a partial schedule for Stuart Haas racing in the Xfinity Series this year, ended up winning the race. And so Briscoe now has two wins in two different series because he won the truck race at Eldora earlier this year, and he doesn't have a full-time ride. He's won two races this year and doesn't have a full-time ride. Matt, do you think he deserves a shot somewhere full-time in 2019? Absolutely. I, I, that's 
quite frustrating, <laughs> I think. Um, you know, at, at least looking at it from from a perspective of, of an athlete and stuff, when you're proving that you can perform in those clutch moments and when you're proving that you can win, I, I don't understand why why the case is the way that it is. Yeah, and there are several other drivers out there that do have a full-time schedule, some even between multiple rides, who haven't won any races this year. So if they can get a full-time ride, then Chase Briscoe absolutely deserves to be a full-time NASCAR driver. So we certainly hope to see him racing full-time somewhere next season. All right, so let's move into the Cup Series race. And boy, do we have a lot to talk about right here. <laughs> oh, I'm ready. Um, first two stages were relatively tame again. Um, again, a couple of instances he- here and there. Yeah, um, minor stuff. Yeah, minor things. So Kurt Busch was on the pole alongside road course ringer A.J. Allmendinger on the outside, and they didn't stay up front for very long. Uh, Kyle Larson started, I think it was fifth, somewhere not too far, Mm -hmm. um, and just ended up making his way to the front of the field, won stage one fairly easily, uh, and was clearly, clearly, I think, the best car on the track throughout the whole race, and looked to be in a pretty good position to earn himself the victory and thus lock himself into the next round of the playoffs. This was also a playoff cutoff race. Uh, before the round of 12. So a lot of added incentives for drivers to get good finishes here and even through the stages just earn as many points as they could. Um, but aside from Larson kind of driving off to the lead by himself, we saw a great side-by-side action actually through the infield even, which a lot of us weren't expecting. Mm. Um, we didn't even know if you really could, if you wanted to drive side-by-side through there, um, let alone make it cleanly without a whole lot of contact. And the drivers did for the most part. Uh, especially toward the end of the race. I think Keselowski had the lead and Larson was coming back up on him and Larson had to run to the inside and everybody thought, well, he's got the best car and he's just going to make a move around him and take the lead. And Keselowski actually hung with him on the outside yeah, uh, yeah. for about five turns and then pulled the crossover coming out of the chicane or out of the infield onto the oval course and held the lead for a little bit while longer there. And then the turning point came with about Eight laps to go, six to ten, some, somewhere in there. Yeah. Ricky Stenhouse Jr. ended up spinning out. The caution came out, and that led to a late race restart. And this is where the cluster, you know what, that everybody was expecting <laughs> kind of came to fruition. So Brad Keselowski got an excellent restart and drove it in to the first left hander very deeply and pretty much just went straight into the wall, as did about half a dozen others <laughs> behind him. Yeah. yeah. No, it was. You know, looking back on that, uh, watching that clip today, uh, you know, it, it wasn't ideal for the the drivers. But you know, if you're a promoter, that was that was what everyone wanted to see. That was what everyone was expecting, um, and it was it was wild. It was wild. Um, you know, and, and we're going to talk about it later. But Larson was one of the guys who got caught up there. He was, yeah. In that, in that crash. If that had happened at any other point in the race, he would have just taken it behind the wall and said, "We're done for the day." Um, but this is the playoffs. You have to tough it out. Yeah. So the race restarts, and Martin Truex Jr. and Jimmy Johnson, who was one of the bubble drivers, jumped out to a uh, 1-2 advantage by themselves, and they were the ones racing for the win. And NBC was in a tough position because they had to focus on them, obviously, because it's who's going to win the race. But you also have to focus on Larson trying to limp his car home and Eric Almarola battling a few cars because he also had been caught up in a couple incidents trying to earn as many points as he can. And how much of an advantage does Jimmy Johnson have? Because Jimmy Johnson's running in second, and at the moment he's pretty safe. Mm. But as those other drivers behind him continue to move up through the points, his advantage continues to get smaller and smaller. Um, So going into the final lap, Johnson, I think, pretty clearly had the better car, certainly had the better car through the chicanes. Yeah. um, And ended up right on Truex's bumper, and so we'll play the clip here. This is Rick Allen, um, Jeff Burton, Steve Letarte, and Dale Earnhardt Jr. calling the finish of the race on NBC. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, before we get to the, the clip and stuff, you know, I was, I was reading some articles today before, before we came on and, and just taking some notes, and in every article, um, whoever the journalist was, some people were saying this was a smart decision, some people were saying this was a bad decision, what he, what he attempted to do. Um, so after the clip, we'll definitely get uh, more in yeah. detail, more in depth, and, and kind of talk that through. All right, so here it is. Jimmy Johnson's last lap attempted pass on Martin Truex Jr. Now he goes to the inside. Here comes Jimmy Johnson. Oh! Locks the brakes up. Oh, he's and spinning. he's going to slide. He slides through the middle. Truex gets oh, tagged. Now it'll be a fight for the finish line. Ryan Blaney in the 12 will yeah. win. He stopped. He pulled came to a full stop to make sure that he was good. It's showing one point to the good. Oh, my goodness. 
Now, he was one point to the good at the moment he crossed the line, but what was going on behind him was Amarola and Larson still working their way through the field as the rest of the field was coming in to finish. And behind them, Daniel Hemrick, who was driving only his second race of the year. He's normally an Xfinity Series driver, um, but got a chance to do a one-off with Richard Childress's team. He tagged Jeffrey Earnhardt, who was the nephew of Dale Jr., who was calling the race. Um, and that sent Earnhardt spinning, and he stalled his car. And he's sitting there on the front stretch, just probably a few couple hundred feet from the finish line, if that. Oh. So here comes Larson. He's nowhere near minimum speed. His front, his right front tires all at a weird angle. Yeah, he's the, Cars totally totaled. destroyed. Yeah. yeah, total car. And, when and he was, he's when he cutting through the chicane, bounces off the wall, now, ends yeah. up passing Jeffrey Earnhardt. And that one point moved him into a three-way tie with both Almarola and Johnson. And because Larson had the highest finish of the three of them, and Almarola had the second highest finish of the three of them in the round of 16... They got the 11th and 12th seed, respectively, mm. and Jimmy Johnson is out of the playoffs. He's gone. And so the drive for an eighth championship will have to wait another year. And, yeah, I kind of want to get your feedback on this, Ben, because, you know, we haven't really had time to talk about it yet. But, I mean, what, what did you think? What did, what did you think with, with Jimmy Johnson? Should he have just kind of hung back and, and taken second there? Um, I mean, you know, I— I, I know what I think, but I, I want to hear what, what you have to say. Well, right. this is a format that puts such an emphasis on winning. And Formula One legend Ayrton Senna once said, if you no longer go for a gap that exists, you are no longer a racing driver. Uh, so I think Jimmy was kind of taking that to heart. He had the faster car, tried to brake kind of late to get in and make a move on Truex and just didn't work out. And unfortunately, Truex ended up getting caught up in it as well. Um, I personally can't blame the guy. You know, you're trying to win a race. And Jimmy actually hasn't won a race in 55 races, I think. It is. It's it's oh, somewhere. Wow, somewhere that. He's getting up there. It's certainly the longest winless streak of his career. Um, Hendrick and Chevy in general have been down on speed this year, and Jimmy's had some rotten luck. So the guy's hungry. He doesn't care about the playoffs. He's already got seven championships. I'm sure he just really wanted to win the race. Yeah, I agree, I agree with the you. Moment. It's, there is a lot of emphasis put on, put on winning. And... When I, when I first saw it, I was like, this is, like, idiotic. Like, I mean, you know, he's a seven-time cup champion, and, and you know, he, he's he's doing this. And if he had just followed Truex home in second, he would have had it. He, yeah, and he would have been on to the round of 12. But, you know, he's he is a champion. We, we've seen that, and champions have a different mindset. And he knows second sucks. Like, it, you know, for lack of better terms, that is the truth. Plain and simple. You don't win seven titles by coming in second you know and and i didn't even know about the kind of the winless drought that he was he was battling through coming into this race which yeah. and that's yeah and that's the other thing like with hendrick's struggles by their standards this year i'm, I'm sure a bunch of back marker teams would love to have the results that they're having this <laughs> season um but by their standards hendrick's been a bit off the pace this season did jimmy really have a shot of a championship anyway so you have to think yeah. he probably would have been eliminated, if not in the round of 12, probably certainly by the round of eight. Yeah. Um, and So I, when you take that into consideration, you yeah. really can't blame the guy, I, I don't think, for going no. for the win. And I know um, that the, you know, the day after the race, he sent out a tweet saying that, you know, he slept on it. And, uh, you know, that's he, he wouldn't he wouldn't really change it. Uh, he wouldn't really have it go any other way. I think he said he would have added more front, yes, front break bias. He did. But aside from he that, um, but he did. He did. Yeah. His tweet was uh, he sent it out to to the seventy eight to their fans and um, you know just apologizing and and yeah. that's that's a class act. That, yeah. that, that that's a class act all the way through. Yeah. So let's talk about the seventy eight's reaction a little bit. So Truex was not too happy. No. Uh, I wouldn't <laughs> expect him to be, and I don't blame him for not being happy. Uh, he just got wrecked for the win and. Neither of them ended up winning the race, so it wasn't intentional. But no. you can't fault the guy for being a little upset. Do, do you think there was a way where he could have, because Johnson had spun out first? Was was there a way where he could have kind of passed him? Or I mean, there wasn't a lot of room coming down the stretch. Well, but the thing it, is, Johnson cut the chicane as a result of his spin. Um, okay. Obviously, he didn't gain an advantage because he was spinning. But the rule is still the rule, and NASCAR's rule was: if you cut the chicane, you have to pull over and stop. And then gas it up again, and they actually would have con they confirmed after the race that they would have penalized him 30 seconds had he not come to that complete stop and kept going. So 
you know, he didn't get in by stopping and doing what he did, but he certainly wouldn't have gotten in and wouldn't have had nearly as good of a finish. Yes, had had he done so. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know what, a ton about, you know, what his reaction was. I know that he was upset, uh, frustrated, and, and, I mean, it's, it, it's that's sport. You know, emotions run high, especially during playoffs, especially, you know, for a spot in the round of 12. And, and I mean, if he kept racing the way that he did, he – he could have made a real run. He could have made yeah. a real run. So I can I can understand, you know, his frustrations. But, you know, putting that in comparison to to Jimmy Johnson, it just goes back to, like, being a class act. And, and uh, you know, obviously Jimmy's been around for quite some time, and, you know, he has the experience um, with media and, you know, uh, running a little low on time. So uh, yeah. we'll switch over yeah. to the next my, couple topics. My main problem – with what trucks do was he spun him out after the race yeah and i feel like you know if you're upset you want to talk about it in the garage that's one thing but don't don't tear up race cars no. no and i like martin i understand being frustrated but that i think was a bit of a cheap move right yeah. there um but yeah let's move on to the knn pro series awesome. which is the highest level of regional racing in nascar and like i said some history being made out in idaho this week Haley deegan your favorite my girl um taking the victory on a last lap pass of her teammate Cole Rouse. So, mm-hmm. Matt, unleash. Give us your reaction. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm stoked. I'm out of my mind. And I know that she's been someone that's, uh, you know, her, her name's come up quite a lot. And, again, this is something that we'll touch upon uh, later. Um, the media loves her. The media loves her. So I think this was, this was huge. This was huge for her. Um, you know, as far as – you know, her, her accomplishing this feat, I found what in her interview yesterday, um, you know, she was talking about, you know, people like, oh, you know, she's the first girl to have won this, that. And she goes, you know, I'm I'm glad. I'm very glad that I could make history. She goes, but I don't want to be the best girl. I want to be the best racer. She goes, at the end of the day, we both put our helmets on the same way. Yeah. So that makes all the media attention that she's getting kind of ironic, I think, because if she doesn't want to be known as the best girl, she just wants to be known as the best racer. But she wins this race, and now she's she was on NASCAR America on NBCSN yesterday. Mm. She was at Fox Sports Studios this morning or this afternoon. Um, Matt, we're going to the K&N race at Dover next week. Do yeah. you think whoever wins that race is going to get on both networks and uh, be doing all this media touring and radio sh- shows no, and everything? No, I, I, don't, I don't think so. Yeah, uh, personally, I don't, I don't think I'm so. I'm 99.9% <laughs> sure they won't be. Um, yeah, Tyler Ankrum is already locked up the East Championship, and I don't think he's going to be on... NBC anytime soon. No. <laughs> no. So this is this is where I stand on the issue. My problem isn't so much that the media is pushing Haley Deegan. My problem is that the media is pushing Haley Deegan excessively while at the same time not pushing the other drivers or even the series as a whole enough. Because NBCSN has a contract to broadcast all the KNN and modified races on tape delay. And they air three or four days after the race happens usually, and they're only an hour-long block, so they have to cut a bunch of the race out, and it's a condensed version. Yeah, and, you know, going off of that, too, you know, I think the the media isn't doing it necessarily in a in a malicious way, but you're right there pushing her to, to be something that she doesn't necessarily want to be. Um, so you wonder kind of how long, you know, or what kind of toll that's going to take on her. Um She's a very, very skilled racer, and, uh, you know, I don't want that to be taken away from her because of, you know, her gender. You know, it, it's kind of like, you know, they're not really looking at the skill as much as, like, who's under the helmet. And, you know, I know that she would agree with me. Yeah. So Well, that's the thing. Yeah. I, I think it's it's not fair to Derek Krause or teammates or mm-hmm. her rivals or the series, but I also think it's not fair to her. Yeah. Um, because yeah. this puts... She's already got a lot of pressure being a female in a male-dominated sport. Yes, absolutely. And now you amplify that with all the attention that she's getting. You know, it, it makes me wonder, you know, if in two years Kyle Busch puts her in one of his trucks and she's going out and she gets off to a shaky start and only runs about 15th every week, what's the fan reaction going to be? Like, you've you've hyped up this Danica heir apparent. Yeah. And she's not doing too well. And, and I'm not saying that's going to happen, and I certainly hope it doesn't happen. But yeah. if it does... This could come back to haunt her, I think, all the, all the attention that she's been getting. And, I mean, again, she's 17. You know, she's still a kid. Yeah, sure. Um, that doesn't, again, that doesn't take away from her skill, but to have the media pushing, yeah. she's 17. I mean, yeah. 
Yeah, so that so in light of the fact that we want to talk about some other racers, uh, Cole Rouse <laughs> is the third BMR, Bill McAnally racing driver, uh, was leading the race. His teammate Derek Krause had pretty much led the whole thing, got shuffled back on a late restart, a back marker spun in front of him and shuffled him back before the restart even. Uh, but Cole's leading the race on the last lap, and Haley pulls a bump and run move, kind of moves him out of the way a little bit, and he went on to finish second, so it's not yeah. like it's not like she dumped him for the win or anything. No. He originally wasn't too happy, um, <laughs> and again, racers, you know, you, you can understand that, but he did come around the next day on Twitter. He said, good job to a badass girl at Haley Deegan. Yeah, I was mad about, I was mad at the time about the bump and run, but I got over it quick. She's an amazing girl and an amazing talent. I'm happy for her. She made history, and I'm a part of it. And Haley quoted a tweet and said, Hey, this year me and Cole became friends and teammates. It's tough when you have to set that aside and drive each other hard for both our first wins. But thanks. I'm sure you'll get me back at some point. <laughs> to which Cole replied, We can call it even if you'll be my date to the NASCAR banquet. Cole, if you're listening, you're going to have to go through me first. <laughs> I know I'm quite a, a bit of ways, but you're going to have to go through me, sir. Yep, and in terms of the championship, Derek Thorne, who drives for Sunrise Ford Racing, is still holding a pretty comfortable lead with two races to go. Quite comfortable. And with how short the fields are these days, it's going to take some pretty rotten, catastrophic luck for him not to win the championship at this point. All right, so in the remaining few minutes we have here, I want to talk a little bit about the Formula One Grand Prix last weekend in Russia. Mm -hmm. Now, this was one where Mercedes had Ferrari pretty well covered, and I think they've kind of locked up the championship at this point. I don't really see how Sebastian Vettel or Ferrari is going to have much of a chance unless, again, something major goes wrong for them. Uh, so Mercedes locked out the front row, started 1-2, were running 1-2, but Valtteri Bottas was ahead of Lewis Hamilton. Bottas is third in the championship point standings right now. On the driver's side, Lewis Hamilton's first. So Mercedes made a controversial decision to invoke team orders and basically told Bottas, let Lewis through so that he can win the race. Yeah. He didn't explicitly say it like that, but that was that was the code. It was implied. <laughs> yep. So, Matt, I, I want to ask you, as somebody who is relatively new, still trying to still get, get immersed in the, in the yeah. motorsport world, what do you think of the concept of team orders? Uh, you know, I, I know we had touched upon it briefly before coming in, and you know, what you said summed it up really, really well was it's a good business move, but when it comes to the sport, it just takes away from it so much. And, and you know, I agree with you. It's it's heinous. It's it's ludicrous. It's insane. Like, you know, you go out there to be the best racer. You go out there to, to take first place. And for someone to say, don't do that, you know, it's going to be helpful to the team, to the business. Don't win. It's like, we're back in the 70s with the mafia, you know, paying people off to, to throw games. And, and, you know, history repeats itself. That's what people say. And you could tell on the podium, Lewis, you know, he's happy he won, but not really too excited. He can't really show a lot of emotion and kind of frustrated in how he won the race. And this is not just an issue with Mercedes. Ferrari are actually the ones who are kind of more known for this. 2002 in Austria when Rubens Barrichello on the final turn very obviously let Michael Schumacher pass. And then 2010 in Germany with the whole famous Fernando is faster than you quote given to Felipe Massa. <laughs> Can you confirm you understand that message? And he lets Fernando by, and Massa never won another race after that. So I think that really hurt him mentally oh, yeah. and affected him for the rest of his career. It's it's sad, too. Yeah. I mean, to, to destroy the mindset of these racers to, you know, just, just get in their head all over, all over money, it, it's, it's sad. It's sad. And again, from a business standpoint, the move makes a lot of sense Absolutely. because it doesn't matter if it's Hamilton, Bottas, Bottas, Hamilton, Mercedes are still going to get 25 plus 18, 43 constructors points for their championship. Yes. Um, but of course, if Lewis finishes ahead of, of Valtteri, he gets an extra seven points. And now he has a 40, instead of having a 43 point lead, he has a 50 point lead over Sebastian Vettel. And that's crucial because you get 25 points for winning a race, only the top 10 get points. So Lewis now basically, his engine can fail in the next two races. Vettel can go out and win both of them, and they'll be equal on points. Yeah. And in fact, I think Lewis will still have a tiebreaker based on most wins. 
Okay. So now Lewis basically has a two race advantage. He can basically lock the championship up by the time they get to Mexico with two races left after that Brazil and Abu Dhabi. Mm-hmm. So again, makes sense from a business model, but it's kind of infuriating, if especially if you're a Bottas fan. Yeah, and being being a fan of the sport, being a fan of sports in general, it's you know you don't want to see it NASCAR go down this way where money is is the main factor in it. Oh. I mean, and a lot of professional sports leagues, it's all now it's all about the show and and you know girls dancing and it's 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 insane. It should be about the sport and. It's really sad to kind of see this this trend occurring. Yeah, I agree. So that's going to be it for the debut episode of The Photo Finish. Next week, Matt and I will actually be heading down to Dover for the K&N and Xfinity races. Very excited. Yeah. Can't stay for the cup race. I've got a 6 a.m. practice on Monday, so <laughs> I want to get back in plenty of time for that. Uh, we'll also recap the Japanese Grand Prix and maybe talk a little bit about NASCAR silly season as well. So stay tuned for all things Marvel and DC on the Comic Collision with Robert Gonzalez and Matt Lewis coming up next here on Scott Radio. I'm Ben Schneider alongside Matt Cole, and we will see you next week. Have a good week, everyone.